glad we're here tonight and uh, uh, we're grateful that the Lord brings us together to, uh, to look at his word and uh, also to share with each other and uh, spend time in prayer. Um, one, one of my concerns as a believer and uh, as a minister is that sometimes people don't understand the importance of gathering together. Um, I'm reminded of a pastor who went, who went into Walmart one day and he, he saw one of his deacons and he said, he said, Brother Joe, I hadn't, and this was just a few years ago, he says, Brother Joe says, I haven't seen you in a while, and, and Brother Joe says, well, um, uh, I, I have been there, but I haven't been there. And the, the pastor said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, y'all started live streaming the, the service. And it's a whole lot easier for me to sit in my pajamas at home and watch you on TV than to be there. Well, the problem with that is God intended for us to gather together. And it's important for us to gather together in many ways. And uh, now that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight. That's not exactly what I'm going to share with you tonight. Uh, I want to I want to talk us talk about uh, something that that's a challenge for me, uh, and that is making decisions. Uh, making decisions is, is, a, is a challenge for me, and, and I'm sure that it's a challenge for you. And uh, I, I want to start off by asking this. Uh, how many of you have an opinion? Don't be bashful. You can raise your hand. How many of you have an opinion? Okay, that, there's one brave, that's two brave people in here. What, what's the right one? Okay, good. That's better. All right, how many of you, your opinion is always right? Okay. Our, our opinion is not always right. All right. So how many opinions are there in a Baptist church? Depends on the membership. Depends on the membership. That's exactly right. It depends on the membership as to, to how many opinions there are in a Baptist church. And so... What's the solution to making decisions? God's word gives us direction. He, he helps us understand. But, but sometimes we think God doesn't know all the ins and the outs. And he, he doesn't, at least that's what it appears, uh, is, is that we, we think that. Uh, our opinions, have you ever thought about how your opinions are formed? Well, sometimes your opinions are formed by how you grew up. Sometimes your opinions are, are formed by the people that you work with. Sometimes your opinions are formed by what you watch on TV. Um, and so our opinions are, are formed by a lot of different inputs and influencers. So when something occurs in our life, most of the time, our opinions come into play. Pastors come to me on a, seems on a regular basis, and, and, and that they tell me that, that what they are going to do in a particular situation. In fact, one of, the, one of the most common ones over the almost 20 years that I've been doing this is, uh, well, brother, I, I just think, uh, I, I think that it's, it's time for me to go somewhere else. And they begin to tell me why. And here's my question for them. So if, if you're ever going to come to me with this type of a, a statement, I'm going to ask you this question. So did God tell you that or is that what you thought up on your own? Which catches them by surprise. And probably 99% of the time they are honest and they say, well, I... I just thought that up on my own. And I said, well, you, you really need to find out what God has to say. One of the men that has influenced my life through his writings and the books that, the, the books that he's written, and, and I've heard him a number of times, is, uh, he, he died uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, his name Henry, was Henry Blackaby. And uh, Henry Blackaby said this, and this is very profound to me. You can't know the truth of a situation until you hear from the one who is the truth. Now, who's the one who is the truth? 
Well, the Bible tells us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so we can't know the truth of a situation until we, we, we know the one who is the truth. Remember that it's God who works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we need to trust God from the bottom of our heart. And that's what this, these two verses that, that I want us to, to think about to, to think about tonight uh, really have to say. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, God's word says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. We want to talk about that in a minute. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight. And so here in, in God's word, he tells us what we need to do. In fact, the, the, the first thing we need to understand is we need to rely confidently on the truth of God, his word, and his Holy Spirit. In fact, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, here's what that, here's what that means for us. That means before we make a decision, we need to trust that God's going to lead us in the right direction with that decision. It doesn't mean that we make a decision and then we're going to trust God that he's going to work everything out. It's important that we begin the process first with trusting God and, and seeking after him. In fact, the Bible tells us that we're to seek after the things of God and the truth of God as if we're seeking after gold or silver. Now, I've never been a prospector, but I've watched enough things on TV to know that those guys would get really serious about looking after or trying to find gold or silver. And if we knew there was somewhere, somewhere around us near where we could dig some up, if we, if we had a feeling, that if, if we had an understanding that there was some there, we, we'd get after it. We'd go try to dig it up. Well, that's the way it is with God, is that he is the treasure. And we have access to him according to his word. And, and so a, a phrase that would define trust, and the, and the first word in that passage is trust. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. A, a phrase that defines that is to rely confidently. That we know in our heart that God is going to accomplish what he desires. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord from the bottom of your heart. That means with, with every bit of it. Trust in the Lord completely. But what does it mean to trust him? It means I have total and complete confidence in the integrity and the ability and the character of God. God will not ever lead me to do anything that's going to destroy me. He's always seeking for my good. Why? Because he loves me. That's what John 3, 16 tells us. For God so loved the world. He so loved the world. He so loved me that he gave his, his one and only son. That when I believe in him, I won't perish. When I trust him, when I rely upon him. And so... I, I trust in him because I always know that God's going to do the best for me. It might not be what I necessarily want at the time, but he's always going to do what's best for me. And so I place myself securely in him or I place my security in him that he's going to watch over me and he's going to accomplish what he desires and the reason is because I know him and I have a relationship with him. I know what he's like because I've been walking with him for, well, since 1975. And so I, I know those things about him. So how can we say that? How can we say that, that, that we can trust God with all our heart? Well, how many 
many of you know that you're going to heaven beyond a shadow of a doubt? You can raise your hand on that one too. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, you know you're going to heaven. Now, let me tell you, I have talked with some folks over the years. In fact, there were some, uh, in, in, uh, in one of my pastorates, I was talking with a senior adult one day. And I said, do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? He said, well, I hope I am. Well, that wasn't, he, he wasn't talking about expecting to be there. He was wishing that he was going to be there because he, he didn't know for certain. But God says we can know for certain. His word says we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I can say for certain that I'm going to heaven when I die because of my experience with him and because of the promise in his word. I know that for sure. It's not just wishful thinking. One of the things that I know about God is he's eternal. He knows what has occurred before it occurred. He knows about it before it even has happened. He knows what is happening now and, and it doesn't surprise him. There have been a lot of things that caught me by surprise, but there's not anything that catches God by surprise. And he knows what's going to happen in the future and he's Lord over that, just like he's Lord over everything else. So, why don't we do this? Since we can trust God with our heavenly home, when we have difficult times putting our faith in God, why don't we say, but you know, I trusted God for my salvation. I'm sure that I'm going to heaven. Why can't I put my trust in God for this? Because I've prayed about it. I've, I've looked in his word about it. It's not something that goes against his word. So we need to submit to his lordship. In fact, it says in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus talks about blessed are the poor in spirit. And blessed are they that mourn. And blessed are the meek. Well, why is someone meek? Well, usually they're meek because they place themselves under someone else's authority. And so meekness comes in our life with Jesus because we've placed ourselves under him. We've submitted to him and his authority and his lordship. And so if we want to be blessed, it begins with poor in spirit. Surrendering humbly to him that, that he's as big as it gets. And then we mourn over the fact that we haven't done that like we should. And then we submit to him. So the first thing is we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart. At some point in time in the future, you're going to vote on a pastor. Now you need to begin trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Or another way to look at that is don't rely on your opinion. Why shouldn't we rely on our opinion? Well, we've already mentioned one of the reasons is because we're not always right. And if I want to know whether I'm right or not, usually I just ask my wife. She'll, she'll let me know whether I'm right or not. Just kidding about that. But we're not infinite in our lives. We're finite. We can't see far. Listen, if I, could, if I could see far enough ahead in the future, I'd never get caught on Interstate 85 after there's been a crash and there's five miles of cars sitting there. If I could, if I could see things, and if I, if I had an infinite understanding, then I, I wouldn't have to do that. We see our past and our present. We 
know what's gone on in the past. We know what's happening right now. But we don't know what's going to happen a minute from now. 1 Corinthians 13 says, we see through a glass darkly. We don't see clearly in this world. And so we don't need to be leaning on our own understanding. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2, it says, if anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know it as he ought to know it. If you think you've got it all worked out, understand you don't know enough of it. You don't, you don't have it all. So do we think by any conjecture or process of our own that we can bring a situation to its best outcome? Since we, we know our weaknesses, since we know we don't know everything, since we understand from this that we don't need to be relying on our own understanding, can we bring something to its best outcome? Probably not. That's why we have to trust. In our minds, it might be good, but, all, but God always brings about the best conclusion. He always does. What we're told not to lean on is ourselves, our own understanding. It means that our conclusions basically are based primarily on our own perceptions, how we perceive a situation is. Our own understanding simply will not not bear up under the full weight of reality. And it was never intended to. God has always wanted us to rely on him and to rely on his truth and the truth of his word. In 1979, having been married less than a year, my wife Angie and I decided to buy a house. We both had good jobs. And we saw that we could handle the payment. At that time, I was a salesman. I wasn't a pastor. We found a house. It was in a good county, one of the surrounding counties of, of, of Clark County and surrounding of Athens. We put down the earnest money. We signed a contract. We were told by people in the know that it would not take long for us to get the financing that we would need to buy the house. Three months went by and no loan. So because everyone had advised us a particular way, we said, well, we'll just extend the contract. In the next three months, we came to understand what we should have done before we did anything. We went to our Heavenly Father and talked with him about it and he impressed upon us that he did not want us to buy that house. And so we, we said because we've, we've held these folks up in their house all this time uh, with, with trying to get the financing, we would we would just go ahead and see how things played out. What we were hoping for was that we would go through another three months, the contract would be over, and then we could go on with our lives. But that's not what happened. On the last possible day that, that the loan could have gone through, it did. So we immediately turned around because we didn't believe God wanted us to have that house. We put it on the market. And it sold in a week. We lost $2,000. In 1979, for a young couple who hadn't been married but about a year, that was a lot of money. But one of the things that we did <coughs> is that we took some of that money that we had saved up that we didn't pour into and we paid off our automobiles. 
two automobiles we had, we just we just went ahead and paid them off. Lean not on your own understanding. The reason that lean not on your own understanding is good is because within a year, God had spoken to me about going to the seminary and he was calling, God was calling me into the ministry and 1980, we moved to New Orleans to go to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. We met a lot of people there. A lot of wonderful people in the seminary who were there for the same reason that I was. But here was, here was the common prayer request almost every day, almost every class that I was in. Pray for our family. This is what I was hearing. Pray for our family because we've got a house that we purchased back home and we can't get rid of it and we're having to make payments on it down here. Oh, it also included pray for us because we bought a house and we bought automobiles and we, uh, we owe and, and, and it, it's just hard for us to come up with the money to, to make these payments. We're, we're, we're trying to get all that straight. God worked in, my, in our lives where when we moved, we didn't know anyone. He worked out the details. Listen for God's voice in everything you do and everywhere you go because he's the one who makes your paths straight. In all your ways. What's the definition of all? All. All. In all your ways, every one of them. In that period of time in there where we were trying to make some decisions about some things, I, I had the opportunity to pastor a church of another denomination. A leader of that denomination had offered me a, a job I had learned from a friend of mine that even before I became a Christian, I had learned from a friend of mine that at the point in time in my life that if, if I was seeking God's direction, I needed to go talk with my father, my, my earthly father. And God had already blessed in that one time. And so when, when the individual offered me a church in another denomination, I said, well, I need to pray about it. And as a part of that prayer, I was going to ask my father, my earthly father, what I should do. And as I talked with my earthly father about it, he said that if God was calling me to the ministry, I needed to go study at the seminary. Well, you know from what I said that I went. But immediately when he said that, I had a peace that that's what I needed to do. I went back, told the the man that, of that denomin other denomination who said that I could be pastor of a church, he would get me into a church. I told him about it, and he said, well, that's great. I said, well, I thought you wanted me to be a pastor of one of your, your congregations. He said, I didn't think you'd go anywhere to study. He said, you were married. I didn't think you would, you would take the time to do that. And he said, but it's great that you're, you're going to seminary. And so we settled on New Orleans Seminary. We traveled to New Orleans a few weeks before class was going to start because that's when I had been accepted. And while we were down there, as we were looking for a place to live, and when I say a few weeks, it was only about three or four weeks before school was going to start, so we had to expedite everything. And we found a place to live down there, an apartment off campus, um, because the seminary didn't have any other place for us at that time. And, and while we were there, Angie said, there's a, there's a placement company uh, who will help me find a job when, I move, when we move down here because of her job that she had with the Westinghouse Corporation in Athens. So we found where that company was, went to talk with them. She had studied to be a computer programmer, and that's what she was doing with uh, with the Westinghouse Corporation. She was a, 
a computer programmer. And so she went to find out what she needed, the documents that she needed so that she could find a job down there. And so when she talked with the company, they said, we may have you an interview the next day. She was thinking she had about three or four weeks before she was going to have to find this other job. But they said, we may have you an interview the next day. And she said, but I don't have a resume. And here's what they said. This really surprised me. They said, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you don't have a resume. And so that next day, she went and interviewed with them. They said, we'll let you know next week. The next week, they called her where she worked at, at Westinghouse in Athens and, and said, you have the job. They sent a moving, moving tr company truck to pack us up and move us. We didn't have a whole lot of furniture and other items then, and we were in the back of the truck. Our stuff was in the back of, back of the truck in a, in a small area. They paid for us to travel to New Orleans when we were going to do that on our own. In fact, they paid for that first time we went down there and finding a place to live. They paid for us to, uh, they gave us a check for the, for the motel and the, the, the travel expense of, of, of going down there. Um, they paid for us to stay in the Holiday Inn for three days until our furniture arrived. They paid $25 a day until... Our furniture arrived. They paid that for us to eat. And back in 1980, that was plenty of money for us to eat off of. And then they gave us $1,500 for any other expenses that we would have incurred. We had more money right at that time than we'd had since we'd been married almost two years. God made our path straight. That's what his word said. That he would make our path straight. When we follow God's word, when we trust in him, when we submit to him, when we humble ourselves, that's what God does. Because that's who he is. He wants to bless us. It's his desire to bless us. He has conditions for that, which I understand. We have conditions. Now, he has unconditional love. But he can't always bless us because of things that are occurring in our life, things that we do or don't do. But when we do what he desires for us to do, he's going to bless us. There's no doubt about it. When we're faithful to him. That's why as we seek in making a decision that we need to trust in the Lord with all our heart. We need to seek him. We need to talk with him about it. I've had a number of situations that have come up recently in, in my life and in the lives of some people that, that I know and I love and I care about. And in some ways I could step in and I could say something or I could possibly do something. But that not, might not be the right thing for me to do because I haven't received clear direction from God as to what I need to do. But I can tell you this, I prayed to God and I turned it over to him and I trust him, he's going to take care of it. He will take care of it. He's going to bring out, he's going to accomplish what needs to be accomplished because that's who he is. As I said, it may not be what I want all the time, but I can guarantee you, it's always going to be what's for the best when he works it out. And I don't have to worry about it. Remember what it says? And let me tell you this. I remember this verse because of Debbie Chastain sitting right here. It's found in, in, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And, the, and it begins like this. Be anxious for nothing. 
And I, I, I remember when, as Debbie was, and I were working together at, at the Hebron Association and, and she said, Miss So, and I can't, I, I think I remember the lady's name, but I'm not going to repeat the lady's name. She said, she said, uh, well, here's what she says. Be anxious for no thing, but by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving in your heart, let your request be made unto God. And the peace that passes all understanding will guard your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus. Be anxious for nothing. I don't have to be anxious for anything. I don't have to lay awake at night worrying about something. Now, my mother was a worrier. I don't want to talk bad about her, but she was a worrier. And she didn't get a lot of sleep at night because she had five children and she was always worried about one of them. One time she got worried because my wife and I were expecting child number five. And she kind of got on to me and she said, y'all don't need to have five children. I said, well, you did. She said, yeah, but it's different. <laughs> Isn't that a parent? Isn't that what a parent says? No, it was, it was different in my day. See, we need to, we need to trust in the Lord and, and he's going to take care of those things. We don't have to worry about it. So can you trust God with all your heart that he will lead you to have the right understanding of the challenges that you face in life? the decisions that you need to make. Can you trust God and rely upon him for the things that he needs to do in Canon Baptist Church? Now, there, he, he gives us direction about things that we're supposed to do regarding the, the mission and work of, of, of the church and, and the work and the mission of the church is to make disciples. That means we need to evangelize and, and we need to help people to grow in Christ. Sometimes I think we don't do too much of that. Can you trust God to lead you and speak to you as to how you need to grow in Christ through the challenge that you have in your life, whatever it might be? As I meet people, one of the questions that I will ask is, how can I pray for you? In fact, today at lunch, I was having, my wife and I were having a lunch with another minister and his wife, and, and there was a man who was waiting on us, and the other, the other minister uh, said, ask that man, how can we pray for you? And the man says, well, there's nothing in particular about me, but would you pray for my three children? The oldest was 11, and then on down to about six or seven years of age. And, and so my friend, the minister, said, yes, I will. And so right there at that table in that restaurant, he asked him, he said, how about if we pray right now? And so we prayed for that man's three sons, right, or three children right now. <clears throat> what did we do? We let that man know that we care about him. I had a lady today in the doctor's office where I went. And she did, she did what they usually do at the doctor's office. I go in and she says, what's your birthday? And I told her what my birthday was. And I said, you know, one of the things I've noticed is nobody asks you what your birthday is. And she said, she laughed and she said, I'm just verifying it's you. I said, I, said, I, I know, I know that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're verifying that, that it's me through, through the birthday. I said, but you know, y'all get, get my hopes up that you're going to send me a birthday card. And she just laughed. She said, yeah, I'd like to be in charge of birthday cards in this office. But then I asked her, I said, how can I pray for you? I could tell it meant something to her for me to ask that question. Trust in the Lord. I don't know where or if she is a part of a congregation anywhere. But I pray for her. Her name's Angela. 
I said, I can remember that name. That's my wife's name. I prayed for her. Trusting in God that God is going to work in her life. I don't know what her needs are, but he knows. We need to expand what we do. But we need to trust God that he's going to work it out. I don't have any idea what's going to happen in that lady's life. But I pray that prayer that she's going to wind up in heaven because she gave her heart and life to Jesus. So, in your life, what is it that you need to trust the Father for? What is it that you need to hand over to him? It's not that God's going to give us everything that we need. But God wants us to call upon him. And he wants to show himself great. As we trust him. And that's what God has done in my life over the years. He's... I've read in his words so many times about the great things that he's done. And, and, and I've experienced in my own life so many of the great things that he has done. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity of being here and learning from your word. Thank thank you for teaching us and guiding us. And Father, we're we're not only grateful that, that right here you're with us, but Father, as we walk out the doors and go home, you're still with us. And as we go to work, you're still with us because your word tells us that. You give us your Holy Spirit. And you give us peace that passes understanding. And you bless us. You bless us each day. So Father, we want to tell you right now how much we appreciate that. And we want to tell you, Heavenly Father, that we're sorry that that we don't turn to you more often. And we don't pray more often. And we're not as faithful to you as we should be. And so, Father, may your Holy Spirit convict our hearts and encourage us to be obedient to you. And we thank you, Father, that we're going to begin to see changes in our life and in the lives of those around us and in your church. Not the building, but the people who are the church. And we pray this prayer in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior who died for us and rose again that we might have eternal life. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, and I hope you have a good night.